All right, so in today's video, we're going to be preparing for a battery backup installation. And uh, Dan, we're actually here at your house in yep. Central Virginia. I'm actually looking forward to doing this. It's been a while since we've done one of these hands-on solar installation videos. It has. But, um, you know, before we get started, let's talk about a few things that, that you've done here as far as preparing for a battery backup installation. You know, one of the things we always talk about is before throwing solar and battery at, at the house, you really want to do what you can to make sure that the house itself is conserving energy as best as possible. So, you yeah. know, efficient appliances, alternate fuel sources. Can you run down real quick, what are some of the things that you've incorporated into the design here that will help with a more more effective battery install? Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, first thing is, is when we went through choosing appliances for our house, uh, we utilized all heating sources for gas purposes. Um, now, there's arguments as to whether that's a pro or con. From my perspective, I used gas because I wanted it for backup means, right, if I lose power, it's a lot easier to make sure I can use critical heating elements, cooktops, even hot water from a gas perspective. The caveat to that is I can't offset that with solar power. So that's maybe things to consider as to which one you're choosing. If you live in an area that's more prone to outages, would highly recommend gas for those purposes. If you're not as prone to outages, then maybe, you know, electric is okay and you can use solar PV to offset that usage. And then of course, new construction. So it's LED lighting, you know, energy, more energy efficient, regular household appliances, right. refrigerators, that type of stuff. Excellent, excellent. Yeah, you know, one of the things that can really be a battery killer is those large electric heating elements. So yeah. just by having the water heater, having the, the stove and the oven running on, na on natural gas or propane mm -hmm. means that we're not going to have to run those heavy heating elements on backup power. And, and what we intend to, to show the audience once all this is done is that we can actually run the entire house on a battery backup system, a modest sized battery backup system, a very affordable battery backup system, and still have all the creature comforts that you would expect. Lighting, air conditioning, be able to cook, be able to you know, keep your food from going bad. That's so exactly forth. right. Yep. So now with the way that we're going to be interfacing the, the solar power and the battery backup system at the house, we've chosen to do it using a standard generator inlet and a generator transfer switch. And, you know, the idea here is that perhaps after you move out of the home, somebody might, might come in with a standard generator that they want to be able to plug in. But we also want to make sure that we're installing this in a code compliant manner so that if the grid goes down, we have a means of safely isolating the house from the electric grid but being able to energize battery power into the house so you still have power for everything you need without risking putting potentially dangerous voltage back on the line where it could hurt some of the lines. That's right, yeah. So, yep. So that's part of what we're gonna be showing you in this video and in this video series, putting together a home battery backup system and then how to interface that in a code compliant way with the home uh, where frankly you as a homeowner might be able to do the majority of this work and then bring in a qualified electrician to make those last few final connections for you so you have a safe code compliant install. All right, so in today's video, we're gonna be doing something a little bit different than our usual educational videos. We're actually gonna be installing a solar whole house battery backup system. Uh, and we're gonna be using one of the new category of modular stackable lithium iron phosphate home battery backup systems, where most of the installation, I would say about 90% of the installation can actually be performed by the homeowner or by the system owner themselves. Now in today's video, we're gonna be showing you the installation of the Blue Eddy EP800 battery backup system, along with three of the B500 battery modules. So each of these battery modules provides five kilowatt hours of storage for a total system storage of 15 kilowatt hours. Now we're gonna be tying the system in for whole house backup. So if you see these electrical panels here behind me, each one of these panels is a full 200 amp panel, which is what you're gonna find in most US homes is a 200 amp service. And we're gonna be feeding this in through a standard generator inlet. And the reason we're gonna be doing that is so that the home could be serviced by the battery backup system or the generator or potentially a combination of both. So with that, let's get to the unboxing of the equipment. All right, so now let's open up the battery module. Okay, so you can see a pretty, pretty easy two-man lift here on each battery module. And so we'll be stacking three of these for our total system capacity of 15 kilowatt hours. Then the inverter unit will set on top. So if you look at the side of the unit here, you have your DC circuit breaker, your on-off switch, and then of course you've got your terminals for your bat battery positive and negative conductors. Okay, so this is gonna serve, this is gonna serve as the base of our battery stack. <laughs> This allows us to adjust the leveling too, if needed, and give us a little bit of a little bit of separation from the ground. Okay, so now we're actually unboxing the inverter unit, which is going to be the main control unit where we have our solar input, we've got our AC input and output, and everything here. So we've got a number of different cable sets that come with the unit. 
All right, so this is the back. So we've got our low voltage communications. And then on the front here, we've got our main, main DC battery connection, on off switch, and then our two PV inputs, as well as our communications. So these are the main building blocks. At this point, we're gonna assemble our battery stack and then we'll make our solar connection and we'll make our AC connections. So here's our final stack. We have got the EP800, the inverter unit here, and then our three B500 battery units for a total 15 kilowatt hour storage stack. So now that we have our inverters and our battery module set into place, the next step here is to make our interconnections. So we're gonna have interconnections between the different battery modules and then we'll make the final connection between the battery stack and the inverter system itself. So that's our communications cables our DC power cables. All right, so the last step here before we power the unit on is we're gonna install the internet uplink device. That way it'll connect the Blue ID system to the cloud so we can monitor and control everything from the app. Okay, so now we're gonna power the unit up. Now within about 40 seconds, the battery should recognize each other. The EP800 should recognize the batteries and we should get a power on indicator here. Okay, you can hear some of the internal relays turning on and now we've got power up to the EP800. Okay, so now that we have the unit powered up, the next step is to download the Blue Eddy app so that we can establish a connection with the unit and monitor and be able to control the unit's functions through the smartphone app. So let's do that now. Okay, so the EP800 has three operating modes, backup power mode, self-consumption mode, and time of use mode. Now, where we are here in Central Virginia, we're still on a one-for-one -one net metering system uh, with a, a flat rate in terms of kilowatt hours. So we're not gonna be taking advantage of any of the time of use or load shifting, we're really gonna be using the EP800 for backup power purposes. And the way that we're gonna deliver backup power to the house is via a standard 50 amp generator inlet, which we'll show you here in a moment. But the next step in the process is to connect solar power to EP800 so that we can raise the batteries to full charge. Okay, now that we have the EP800 online, the next step is to connect our solar power. Now out in the field, we've deployed eight 360 watt solar panels for a total solar power of 2,880 watts. And all eight panels are wired in series. So we're delivering 360 volts to our unit here. Uh, by the way, for those of you that are wondering, you can deliver anywhere between 150 to 500 volts DC input on the solar side. So let's go ahead and connect our MC4s. All right, now if we switch back to the app, we should see solar production coming in now. See right now we're showing about 500, about 500 watts of solar production. I'd like to let this run for a while, bring the battery state of charge up as high as possible before we start our load testing. Okay, pretty soon we're going to activate backup power within the home. But first I wanna show you the method that we're using to connect the EP800 to the home in a safe code compliant manner. Now what we've installed here is a generator inlet. It's a standard generator inlet which allows us to use a standard generator cord to deliver power uh, into the house panel. Uh, and that way, you know, after let's say Dan moves out of the house um, and wants to take the battery backup system with them, the house will already be wired in a code compliant manner and the new owner might come in with a portable generator and they can tie in right here as well. All right, now on the other side of that generator inlet is this 200 amp electrical panel. So we're gonna be wiring this for whole house backup, including all the circuits in this panel. Now, if you take a look, the generator inlet is on a 50 amp circuit feeding in here on this circuit breaker. And we fitted the electrical panel with a mechanical interlock device. Now what this does, this is important. It basically, it, it forces us to turn off main power, turn off grid power before we can activate backup power. So again, this is a safety thing. Make sure that if we're running on our own backup power in the house, there's no chance of us sending that voltage back out on the electrical lines where it could damage linesmen who are trying to work to repair, uh, repair the electric grid. So once we're ready to do our load test, we're gonna turn main power off, we're gonna activate backup power into the panel, and, and we're essentially gonna be running a whole house load test. So I'm excited to show you guys how the unit performs under these conditions. Okay, so now we're gonna make our hardwire connection to the EP800 for the backup power source and then we're gonna use this to feed our generator cord. All right, now we're gonna simulate our power outage. So my next step is to deactivate the main breaker on both panels. And now we're gonna slide our interlock. Again, you'll notice this, this interlock basically forces you to have main power grid connection off before you can activate backup power. That's a safety feature for the linesman. Also gives you some time if you need to turn off any of your, your larger loads non-essential loads that could overload the system, now would be the time to turn those large breakers off. 
But in this case, because the house is set up in such an energy efficient manner, including energy efficient air conditioning units, we're gonna energize the entire panel and then run some load tests here. So here we go with backup power. All right, I see the lights are back on here in the garage. And now let's take a look at the app and see what the consumption is. I would expect right now the base load in the house without the air conditioners running, I would expect about a thousand watt draw, somewhere between 700 to a thousand watt draw. And then when the air conditioners kick on, we're expected to go up to about 4,000 watts. Okay, so now we have the system activated. When we're able to pull up on the app, I can see right now we've got 521 watts coming in from solar. The base load in the house is 609 watts. So that difference is being provided for by the battery, which you can see here. All right, now I'm interested to turn the air conditioner on to see how the EP800 stacks up. So we saw a little bit of a flicker on the lights when the air conditioning unit turned on, and now the load has leveled off to 2.5 kilowatts. So again, well within the, the specifications of the EP800, and it looks like, yeah, now the load in the house, with, with all the house and the air conditioner running, 2.8 kilowatts. So the air conditioner itself is pulling 2.2 kilowatts of power, and of course that's being provided by the battery, uh, two thirds or so is coming from the battery. One third is coming from the solar production. We're actually getting about 1.1 1, 1 .1 kilowatts of solar production now. Yeah, so all I noticed was a slight flicker on the lights when the air conditioning compressor first kicked on that lasted about two seconds. And then again, the air conditioners leveled off to about 2.2 kilowatts of continuous load. So we'll let this run for a few minutes, make sure everything appears normal within the house and then we can set it back to a more reasonable temperature. All right, so we're well into our load test now. We have the entire house panel energized here. We have the air conditioner compressor running. That puts us at total at about 2.8 kilowatts of total load. I suppose we could even do some laundry or run the coffee maker. So now this is the entire house with the coffee maker with the air conditioning compressor running as well. And about 740 watts coming in from solar, the rest coming from the battery. Okay. So I can, I can pretty comfortably say this is probably a, is about as bad as it's going to get in an emergency power situation. You've got all the base load in the house, the air conditioner, the coffee maker, and the microwave going. Your cooktop is, is gas, so that's not gonna draw anything. So really, you know, you can operate here in an off-grid mode with all the creature comforts that you're used to and, um, and not have to worry about it and, and do it in a sustainable fashion you know, assuming you have enough sunlight so that the solar can be recharging that battery every day. All right, Dan, so we, we gave the, the unit a good exercise here. We did the whole house backup test, ran the air conditioning compressor, stove, coffee maker, uh, even ran the microwave. Yeah. Everything held up pretty well. What were your impressions of the unit? Really cool. I mean, it was an instantaneous transfer of power. As soon as we simulated the outage, killed the main and turn, or the main breaker and turned on the, the, the back feed, it was, it was instantaneous. Um, you know, all the lights, especially the smaller loads, any of the 120s were no, you know, no issues. The only thing we noticed is when we turned on the AC, set it down to like 65. As soon as that turned on, we got a little bit of flicker of the lights here in the garage, but probably about two seconds worth and then continue to power the load, no problem. So Yeah. And I, and I would think realistically, you know, if you're in a prolonged backup situation, you're probably not going to be running the AC full blast. You're going to want to be using that air conditioning sparingly, right? Sure. So you make sure you have power through the night. But I think as far as just covering like the base loads within the house, those sort of always on appliances, your fridge, your laptop, you know, your internet, things seem to handle it with, with really not, not even really breaking a sweat. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, uh, ideally too, right, you, you're mindful of how we use those loads, especially even in the peaks of summer. You know, look, it is a luxury to have air conditioning running. And in some cases you could say it's a necessity, but ceiling fans, plug-in fans obviously would have worked just fine with how we used it. Um, I could have powered my television, keep kids or family entertained. I could, you know, in my case, have hot water still because I have a gas uh, hot water system. So from that perspective, I, I mean, pretty much everything else minus the luxury of, of air conditioning, I could have ran in the peak of summer for a very long time. And then even in this case, I could run air conditioning in those dire situations if I had to. Um, as of the recording today, it's beautiful temperatures. I really didn't even need to run, you know, air conditioning, but you know, I could yeah. do it if I had to. Yeah. Yeah. And, and for the purposes of our, of our simulation here, you know, we only have 2.8 kilowatts or 2.9 kilowatts of PV hooked up. Yeah. If we had double the size of the PV array, that would have been enough solar to carry the air conditioning anyway. Right. So the air conditioning wouldn't even have really touched the battery. It effectively is all just passing through Pass at that through, point. Yeah. Yeah. So again, we we're, we're demoing with a really small array, but if you had a more average system size, 
you know, roof mounted or on a ground mounted application, but just an average residential system size, then it would have been more than enough to sustain in this case. Yeah, and I think that's what you're going to find too, is your, your air conditioning demand is going to be coincident with your, your peak solar production, right? In other words, when it's the hot, sunny part of the day, that's when your AC is going to be drawing the hardest, but that's also when your solar is going to be producing the most. So it shouldn't be really taxing the battery. The solar should be carrying most of that load. And then, of course, you mentioned the water heater. Since that's gas on demand, barely any electrical draw, ran the cooktop as well, the igniter. Really, it's all just the igniter because you're burning gas for the heat. So all of that was negligible. So, so I, I, I'd say what I saw here was pretty much you can run your whole house, you can live a normal life running on backup power with the 15 kilowatt hour storage yep. and, um, and not really have to miss a beat. Yeah, and granted the way that we're demoing it here at my own property is one of the possible applications of it, right? We're using it as kind of more of a generator with a, with a plug-in mechanism, but you can have this wired up as well where it could be a more instantaneous permanent solution tied directly into a solar array so that everything is you lose power and instantaneously practically speaking the way that i have it i'd have to come out here i would detect that i lost power i would you know flip things on flip things off but you could also use this unit as a, a full-time proper backup system um and from the assembly that we've done you know for how it works i mean i think it's a pretty great unit for what it is I, I agree. For those of you that are watching in California or Arizona or other markets where you have significant time of use rates um, or, or maybe of certain hours where you, where you have on peak rates where you want to avoid having to purchase from the utility during those rates, if you were to install EP800 in more of a permanent hardwired fashion, you can actually just program the unit to self-consume during those peak rate hours. So whether your solar is producing or not, you can have EP800 run the house during those peak hours so you're never having to buy from the utility and then just recharge the battery from the grid later that night when the peak rate hours are over or just wait the next day and let the solar panels recharge the battery and then you can cycle it that way. So a lot of different ways you can use it. Um, Dan, again, I'm, I'm really excited about this, this new category of, of um, I would say this is like mostly DIY install where the homeowner, the system owner can do 90% of the heavy lifting themselves and then just bring the electrician in, in, in your case, to do the generator hookup, yep. you know, or to do the final tie-ins if you're doing more of a permanent install. But the idea is that you can save a lot of cost if you're buying the equipment directly. And by the way, check the link in the description below. We'll have a link where you can get 5% um, get off the normal price by purchasing through Solar Surge. So make sure you hit that link if you're looking to, to pick up one of these units. But you as an owner can do 90% of this work yourself. You bring the electrician in for what, maybe three, four hours of work tops, yeah. do the generator uh, hookup or just do a hard wire hookup um, and then that's it. You know, the rest of the assembly of the solar and batteries can be done by the system owner. And the way that they've pre-cut and color coded all the wires, they've got different connectors for each, it, it's, it's, almost, it's almost idiot proof. I mean, you, you literally just match up color for color, connector shape to connector shape. It's, it's, it's almost impossible to wire it the wrong way because it just won't fit. That's one of the things I can appreciate too is the way that, I mean, all these things were in nice, they're sitting on the ground over here, but they were in nice branded Blue Eddy baggies, you know, for us. They were, like you said, I mean, it's pretty dummy proof. I think for those as well that are much more detailed and want things that are clean and organized and just looks clean, that wiring uh, pre-cut that they already had made it, made it really easy and nice. And I mean, it's a good-looking system. I mean, you know, I'm, we're both about six foot, you know, two. We've got three battery units here with the inverter on top. Believe you can actually go one more battery unit on here as well, which would probably bring it up to about about 72 inches in total height um, for 20 kilowatt hours of storage. But in this case, 15 kilowatt hours of storage and pretty great unit, sleek, small. I mean. <laughs> come a long way since the stuff we've done back in the day. So, yeah, very no, cool. No, and I, and I would say, you know, obviously we've been recording a lot of the process we've been sharing with you on these videos, but, you know, if we were to have done this just kind of start to finish without having to mess with the cameras and everything like that, I, I would say I've done maybe two hours of real work to, to put this together, yeah. you know, compared to in the back in the day, right? We would have two, three days of work Absolutely. to build these type of systems. So I think uh, this is a reflection of the current state-of-the-art technology. Really excited to do it. And I want to thank Blue Eddy for supporting the channel and for sponsoring today's video.